spoke uh, last year as part of our Distinguished Peacemakers Lecture Series, and uh, we've invited him back again now because he's just published a book, which I'm actually reading, it, and I think it's one of the most important books that's come out of the Arab world uh, probably in the last, uh, probably in the last generation or so. One of the most important books, not the most important, but I think it's an outstanding book. I don't get this commission from the sales, so I'm not, uh, I have no vested interest in it. But it's just an extraordinarily important book that will be available for sale from the bookstore here. They're going to bring it here. And we thought it was important enough uh, to have a lecture by Alistair about uh, the, the book and the research that he's done behind the book and what it tells us uh, about uh, the Islamic movement. So the book is called Resistance, the Essence of the Islamist Revolution. Uh, just published by Google Books. And uh, Alistair is uh, the co-director and founder of Conflicts Forum, which is a group that has, an NGO that has been working for about, what, three, four years now, I think, and doing um, a lot of work, essentially trying to help the Western world and the Islamist movements understand each other uh, better, connect better, but mostly looking at Islamist movements mainstream Islamist movements and what they're all about. And this book, in a way, uh, provides tremendous background uh, about what the Islamist revolution uh, is all about, uh, what he calls resistance. Um, uh, he has a, a distinguished and long career in public service. Uh, he worked uh, in the British public service. He worked in the uh, European Union public service. He was security advisor to the European Union uh, high representative uh, uh, special representative to the Middle East, uh, peace process. He was advisor to the International Quartet, uh, which is maybe not one of the brightest spots on his CV, since the quartet has <laughs> not been one of the great successes in my book, but that's just a private uh, editorial <laughs> comment for <laughs> um, And uh, he was active in uh, local affairs in Palestine between the different uh, government Islamist groups. Uh, um, he helped uh, resolve the mediate the negotiations leading to the ceasefire declared by Hamas and Islam Jihad way back in 2003, and the negotiations that uh, led to the ending of the siege of the Church of the Nativity in, in Bethlehem, which you probably watched on TV. Um, and he now is uh, running uh, conflicts forums. Uh, they're doing a lot of interesting work. A lot of it is quiet, but some of it uh, is public. He was also a staff member of President Clinton's fact-finding committee led by then Senator George Mitchell uh, into the causes of the second intifada in the year 2000. So we're very pleased that Alistair is back to talk about his book and uh, his research. And uh, he'll talk for about 30, 35 minutes. And then there'll be an open discussion in which you can ask him about uh, anything you want related to, to this field or his, uh, his experience in conflict resolution. Um, so I'd like to uh, just have you join me welcoming Alistair and also thanking uh, Selim Terejirian and, and Zaki Boulos, our staff members, for arranging uh, this meeting. Just at the end of last month, uh, I was uh, in London picked up a magazine, one of the leading, if you like, political magazines that are uh, on sale in London. And it was marking the 30th anniversary of the Iranian Revolution. So it was devoted, the articles were largely devoted to this topic. And I opened the lead article, which uh, said effectively, that the Iranian Revolution had come about because there had been a little hiccup in the Shah's management of the merchants that comprised the bazaar in Tehran. And that this essentially was what the Iranian Revolution was about, and this was the trigger that started it. I was really shocked, so shocked, that after 30 years, we conclude that the Iranian Revolution was no more than an economic blip, a mismanagement by the Shah, a side slip in the management of the bizarre economy.
economy in Tehran. And it still seems to me extraordinary that we find it so difficult um, and so hard to understand uh, what happened. Was it just no more than a little bit of economic hardship or mismanagement that took place uh, in Iraq at the time? And I think equally, in the way in which perhaps the substance of the Iranian revolution uh, gets erased from the force uh, from Western thinking and Western understanding, I think equally it's clear that the West finds it as hard to understand why there is a resistance. What is this resistance and why there is a resistance? And still, I think, 30 years on, there seems to be very little clarity uh, about what it is. Clearly there are going to be many suggestions of what the, now I'm talking about the Islamist revolution, which incorporates the Islamic revolution. There are probably as many definitions about what is the revolution as there are Muslims uh, here uh, in the world. Uh, but I will offer uh, at least my view of, of what it was about. And I believe that the essence of the Islamist revolution is essentially a passionate refusal, a passionate refusal to accept the understanding of their self and an understanding of the world as dominated by Western secular consciousness. It's for Islamists, all of the means of Western understanding seem to converge on a single unified vision of reality. And the essence, if you like, of the Islamist revolution uh, was an attempt to put forward an alternative vision, an alternative vision not only of the world, but of the human being uh, as well, in that world. And therefore, what I'm arguing in a sense, and try and argue at length in the book, is that the Islamist revolution is essentially something that is both explainable and rational and has a historical uh, explanation to it. In other words, it's not some irrational act, it's not some whimsy of, uh, of Islam or of religion that is failing to react uh, to modernity. I'm arguing that it is something very different. And I think the basis of uh, the Islamist revolution, and indeed the Islamic revolution, derives from the twin pillars of what I call uh, Western modernity, the twin pillars that I describe of Western modernity. And what I mean by that is uh, going back to the first pillar, uh, was essentially what historians now call uh, the great, the grand uh, transformation. This is something that happened in Britain, primarily, and then in the rest of Europe and elsewhere. But in the 18th century, when the idea, the ideas that had come out of, if you like, Protestant theology, of, of the idea of providence and the invisible hand, were translated into the idea of the market mechanism, working through this invisible hand, as the mechanism through the intersection of human beings pursuing individual and private interests would nonetheless, in the cumulative total, uh, lead to the most effective uh, welfare and most effective uh, material situation for humans collectively as well as for the individual. But what happened in the grand transformation, in the great transformation of Europe, was more than that. It was a determined policy to try to make these markets effective and efficient. And to that end, primacy of market efficiency, both in economic and in political terms, other social, political affairs were, were subordinated. This didn't happen spontaneously. There was no natural flowering of markets. It didn't come about in an easy fashion. In fact, I think modern historians believe it would be impossible to do these transformations in any form of democracy or any form of community that we have today. They were the result of massive, <coughs> huge, 
state intervention forced the changes, first of all in Britain, that were necessary to bring about uh, the market structure, to which politics, community, social affairs had to be subordinated in order to make something uh, that was effective and efficient. But closely allied to that was the second pillar, the second pillar of modernity, which was also an idea deeply rooted in, in European myth that there was a natural order, natural order to society, that the normal disorder and chaos of people living together somehow to all this disorder and jostling out of this competition, there was an underlying natural order of the invisible hand, both political, therefore, and uh, uh, economic. And of course, uh, this idea of the natural order was something that was taken up and transformed in terms of the uh, architect of the American Constitution later the idea of this natural order of the need for competitiveness and the balance of uh, power uh, became the underpinning of the American Constitution, directly influenced by people like Paine and others, and became not only the, the bedrock of the American Constitution, but also the idea of this competitive environment became the structure of democracy for the West in terms of the United States the balance between the Senate and the Congress, between the various, the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. All of these competitions were again thought that somehow out of that, a natural harmony and order uh, uh, would arise from them. And also from these ideas clearly came the whole idea of the nation state, the modern sense of what is the, the shape and the type government that is suitable for modernity, uh, and of course, the Western idea of democracy itself. It was a very powerful, a very strong idea that held enormous sway. It held a tight grip <coughs> over thinking uh, for nearly 300 years, and brought Islam almost to the brink of extinction by the 1920s. By that period, Islam was really hanging on by its fingernails uh, at that point. It was just there because what had happened uh, during that period uh, was a crisis of the export of the idea of the great transformation from Europe to deep areas, to the Middle East and to Muslim societies. And what had happened in that period in the century to the 1920s were some of the most, the largest forms of social engineering, undertaken with the best of intention to try and bring about a modern nation state and a modern economy. But during that period, nearly five million Muslims were ethnically cleansed from the area of the western provinces of the Ottoman state in the interest of building new nation states, ethnically, unified, unitary nation states in places in Greece, in the Baltic, and other areas. And in that process, there were not only ethnic cleansing took place in the Western states, uh, but also uh, there were swaps of populations that took place, swaps of Muslim Greeks for Christian Greeks between Turkey and what is now uh, Greece. But of course, the epitome of the idea uh, of the process of the grand transformation took place in Turkey and then subsequently in Iraq. But as you all know, what happened in terms of making a modern Western state on the ideas of the grand transformation involved the massacre of a million Armenians. It involved the killing of a quarter of a million Assyrians. It involved uh, the suppression of the Kurds. Uh, and it involved ultimately uh, the suppression uh, of Islam. As the Turks described Islam essentially uh, as the joke, as the cancer that was uh, shaming the modernity uh, of Turkey. 
uh, and ultimately the caliphate uh, was abolished. The crisis that ensued was actually very little different from that that had ensued in Europe, because of course the great transformation had had the same effect in many parts of Europe. And although we do not see it now so clearly in those terms, the huge transformation of society in Europe that had taken place had, of course, produced a social crisis. And it actually produced the revolutions that engulfed the Europe of that first world period. The revolutions in Russia and the revolutions that nearly happened in much of Europe from the stresses and strains of the great transformation. But that great transformation that was transposed into, into Muslim society, of course, had the same effect of bringing the Muslim states to a process of, of deep crisis. Islam, as I say, was under pressure from secularization, not only in Turkey, but in Iran, and, and of course, in Egypt and many parts of the world, in order to modernize and to restructure and commit to the social changes that were necessary to bring about an effective market system in the interest of modernity and the people of the region. And underneath, from the bottom up, it was being attacked by another form of secularism, of Marxism, that was attracting many of the young uh, away uh, from Islam. So, in crisis, just as Christianity, when it was in crisis in the Dark Ages, tried to rediscover a new self, invent a new self, which would find solutions to its problems, take its way from the problems that it faced. So Islam, at that time in the wake of the 1920s, began a journey, a process, a journey that had not yet ended, of trying to rediscover itself, find new solutions, the problems uh, that it was dealing with. Like the Christians many centuries before, Islam turned to its roots, and of course it turned to the Quran. As all of you here I'm sure know, the Quran is not a philosophical document. It is not an administrative blueprint. It is not a new religion. And it says very clearly that the Quran is essentially intended to be a reminder, to be a reminder to all human beings of old truths, old truths that perhaps we have forgotten. And that it essentially it is about this. And from this, Islam is drew an important political insight. Because the Quran reminded everyone that for human beings, be successful in living together. Their society had to be based on that of equity and justice <coughs> and compassion. Not only did human beings have to act with those qualities, but they had to experience reciprocally those people acting communally in the same way. And that this was the only way this was the old truth that the Quran reminded all of us, that the only way for human beings to live successfully together is through this. It was not only a political message, but it was clearly a religious one, which was different from a Christian view of faith, because the Quran also makes it clear that you don't have a sudden experience of the transcendent or of God uh, in that same way but actually the process of understanding, of opening your understanding in this way, comes from the day-to-day -day living and experiencing of being part of a community that practices and undertakes the qualities of equity and of justice and, and of compassion. This, in a sense, is at the heart of, if you like, the Islamist political Islam's revolution. Because what it is doing, effectively, is a complete inversion of the Western paradigm of the Great Transformation. The Great 
transformation, <coughs> essentially, as I said, was the decision by Western states to make the market, both in economics and in the sense of politics, if you like, the key <coughs> to society, to which other objectives, political, social, communal, were subordinated. And what political Islam was doing was doing the opposite, making a society that actually practices <coughs> and puts compassion, equity, and justice as the prime objective to which other aspects, including the market and community and political issues, should be subordinate. So it is a complete inversion, if you like, of the Western principle. It is not social democracy. And it is quite different from social democracy. People often suggest it is no more. Because the great difference is that social dem democracy accepts the principles of the market, but seeks to try and modify and mitigate some of the adverse effects and implications of the market. But the, the idea and the concept of political Islam is the opposite, is to put these principles first and to subordinate the working of the market, the work can be, the market can still be a part of it, but providing it acts to reinforce and support the principles of justice, equity, and compassion between human beings acting together. In this sense, not only is it an inversion, but it's also an inversion of the organizational base of Western Western society was based around the idea of the rational human being, of individualism. And individualism, as it was seen in the Western system, was essentially that the engine of communal welfare in aggregate, through the intersection of the market. And of course, political Islam model is different, that it is actually through the community, through people living together, and acting these principles and also being the beneficiaries of receiving others acting in the same way to them uh, that you uh, uh, is the organizational principle uh, for society. So it is a change from the individual to the collective. But more <coughs> importantly, and here is where it begins to have, of course, much wider political significance, of course, it is about going to the roots of all our common, uh, common philosophical assumptions. It goes to the roots of what Plato bequeathed to us, about what is the purpose of politics. Is democracy and politics simply that of individual choice and individual self and the expression of the self in that way? Or does politics have a purpose? And the purpose of that is of ensuring that human beings to the best that is possible act according to certain moral principles. So of course that there are not only, only uh, questions of economics and politics, it goes to the very heart of what is politics about, and therefore what is the purpose of, of politics. But the revolution essentially uh, was more than that. It was not just simply a political vision. It was also an attempt to escape from this process to escape from a world of histor historicality uh, and determinism and materialism, the grip, if you like, the hegemony of the Cartesian view of the world, which had so, in their view, restricted things. It was an attempt to try and escape from that by assuming an understanding of the understanding of the world that was based not just, if you like, on religion, but was also political, philosophical, and metaphysical. In other words, that you couldn't see what the revolution was about, or you couldn't understand the revolution without understanding that it was both a philosophical and a metaphysical issue, as well as simply one uh, of politics, uh, too. From that, Islamism, political Islamism, and the revolution uh, defined a radically different view uh, of an understanding of the human being. An 
understanding of the human being that is not split into component parts, that awareness and consciousness is not simply just the sum of psychology, sociology, historical events, and other causes and determinants, uh, but of a human being that is capable of, of moving beyond the appearances that surround us. There's a well-known book that describes, uh, it's entitled Ways of Seeing. Ways of Seeing, and it looks at how you look at things, and how depending on the assumptions and thinking <coughs> that with which you have, uh, are endowed with or learn from your beginning, it can transform entirely the way you see the world, a transformative way of looking at the world. And what this was offering by changing the way in which people look was also a change of subjective reality, a change of presence which allowed people to look at things in a different way. And part of that process of changing the way in which people look at the world was to look also at this division, this sharp distinction that the West had between the subject and object, between the human being uh, as a subject and the world around us as objects to be controlled and dominated and split and categorized and studied as, as a specimen of objects. For Islamists, this provided a real relief, an attempt, an opening to new thinking, to be able to move towards deductive and intuitive, no longer caught, if you like, in that Cartesian instrumental thing, but be able to move beyond it. And that was critical in the political transformations that took place, I would say, not only in Iran, but in movements like Hezbollah too. Because what it did was open out the ability for political movements to use myth, to go back to the imagination, to use symbol and myth as a way not only of transforming the way people looked and saw the world around them, but to transform themselves politically uh, uh, as well. This has been an experience that has excited and mobilized millions of people. When I asked a Hezbollah leader some years ago, what was the most important thing that had come out of the revolution, the Iranian revolution today? He replied immediately, for the first time in 200 years, we could think free again. So this is important. It is important. And also, it is important because it provides a grand purpose to human existence today. For many Muslims, it's been to open the potential, to rise above what they are, to see the potential as being greater than those human beings that they are at the present, that gave a purpose and a destination back to life beyond being consumers and being the simply consumers and about a life of shopping and entertainment of lifestyle. So it was a huge change. And why I have elaborated slightly on, on this process is because, of course, what happened and what was so significant from the Islamic revolution, it actually turned Islam again into a dynamic force. A dynamic force uh, that was both dynamic politically but also socially economically as well. And what I would like, what I'm trying to emphasize is that it's actually quite difficult even to explain this now in our post-Cartesian world, where we don't have any language for the types of, if you like, transformation uh, that both Iran and Hezbollah have been going through. Because as soon as you move from the objects and the real and the chair and the world of appearance, you're talking in English then about mysticism or the fantastic or imaginary, but things that are clearly not part of the Cartesian reality. It is something that is different. So it is very hard to explain that, how important these transformations in people were to the people as, as today. So in short, what I am saying is that the Islamist revolution is about ideas. It's only just started in this place. But it's also about philosophy, and it's also 
also about different ways about thinking of the world in which we live. It's clearly not over, right? and it's still on its way. So why, then, do we face and do we see intolerant, dogmatic Islamic groups that offer a violent and dogma? Why do they offer this, and why do we not get from them instead philosophy of the type that I've just described? And I would say that the answer to this and very briefly, is because we have been created. The West has been created. I'm not suggesting a conspiracy, and I'm not suggesting that this was done deliberately. But of course, to the revolutionary current, there is also another current, another counter-revolutionary current, which of course is both anti-rational, anti-philosophical, anti heterosexual and literalist and dogmatic. We have today, if you like, a, a template that we impose, or the West impose, is of moderate versus extreme. But this model, I suggest, is extremely, not only simplistic, uh, but flawed. Because actually it misidentifies how uh, those with a, a narrow hatred of any unorthodoxy, any heresy, can actually turn to something that is more dangerous and more dangerous to their own community, as well as others uh, uh, too. And this has come about essentially by an attempt by the West over the years to <coughs> misuse or to use form of a political Islamism, Salafism, in order to try and contain and to minimize and circumscribe the threat that the West has seen for the last 50 years. What we have seen in the sense is that the West has used a form of apolitical Salafism, the Saudi orientation of Salafism, which of course is largely apolitical. It is for the large and overwhelming part fairly comprised of pious and sincere people uh, who are seeking reform and a return to the fundamentals of the Quran and the Hadith and the practice of the pious forebear. But when this group is put under pressure, when it is used for Western political purposes, it has time and time again fractured and formed schism after schism after schism. And of those dissidents, first moved from being apolitical movement and quickly moved to being both political, violent, and quite dangerous. We have used the West for various purposes of close relations, has used this form of what it saw was apolitical Islamism. And of course, they saw it as being something that could be used. They've used this form of apolitical Islamism, first of all, to curb nationalism. They've used it to curb Marxism. They've used it to curb the Soviet Union. They used it in Afghanistan uh, to undermine and destroy the Soviet Union. They have used it to curb Iran. They have used it to curb Shiism. They're using it now in Iraq to contain Shiism. They are now using it in Afghanistan in Pakistan uh, to curb what they have seen to be the threat uh, to Western interests during this period. And of course, for many of these, as I say, sincere, pious Salafs, when they see the purposes to which they have been used, when they see Iraq now occupied again, it takes <coughs> them back to a dark period of Islamic history when the Mongols destroyed Muslim cities, and when the Mongols themselves both sacked Baghdad and set themselves up as a caliph in the country. And of course, it was from that period, from that dark period of history, that Muslims reflected on what happened, and how they had come to this power, and concluded this had come about because Islam had gone astray. It had gone astray because of Sufism, Shiism, of 
practices of uh, visiting graves and respecting saints, and that Islam needed to be cleansed of these in order to survive. And of course, Ibn Taymiyyah uh, became the authority of that period, both in contesting the legitimacy of the Mongols uh, to be the caliph, still the same heathens they ever were, and issued his fatwa against reasoning, against philosophy, against sufis, and against heresy of all sorts. And just as then, Salafis who look at the modern Middle East and see parallels between Iraq with now a Shi government, with an Iraq occupied by Western forces again, instead of the Mongols, they return and migrate from a politicism towards Ibn Taymiyyah. And from Ibn Taymiyyah, they migrate often further to Zarqar. And most of these dangerous groups that we see today are forms of dissidents or splinter groups uh, from this load of uh, Islamism that, if you like, has formed this uh, orientation of Islamism, which is prone under this pressure to fragment and move in a different way. What I am suggesting is that we have the wrong extremes and the wrong models. We have both dealing with apples and oranges, put them in the same uh, category. We have, on the one hand, if you like, Hamas and Hezbollah against the violent haters of heterodox and these dangerous thinkers. What is not perhaps surprising is that in a sense, what we have seen is that Western dogmatic closure in terms of its own view of Islam and its own attempt to pursue a template of moderates versus extremists. Its own dogmatic closure has not surprisingly given rise to dogmatism in Islamism too. And at the same time that it has given rise and bears a certain responsibility for the rise of dogmatic Islam, which it contends with, the West has also, by virtue of the mechanical approach of a template of a moderates versus extremist, demonized and hollowed out and tried to weaken uh, those forces that are non-literous, non-dogmatic, and what I would describe as reasoning Islam. This, in sum, has left the world, Islam, in a very dangerous place. <coughs> more unstable, more hollowed out, and more decentralized than it was. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for the talk. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about what you mean by apolitical Islamism? And you know, how, given what you said before, that Islam is a, an entire way of living, how can you be an apolitical Islamist, you know, not wanting to implement Islam in the public arena? Um, and can you give us some examples of the groups, the West, you say the West is using these apolitical Salafi groups to undermine Iran, under, undermine the Shia, undermine Iraq, Afghanistan. Can you give us some examples of which groups you believe the West is using to do that? And just finally, I know there's some good questions. If, if framing the argument in this way between um, a market in the West which is completely dispassionate and non-communal and you know, a political Islam which is based only on justice and communal activity and that kind of thing. Aren't we really talking about a clash of civilizations? Um, how can the West work with, if the West is the exact opposite of political Islam, how can it work with Three questions. 
Um, first is, what is a political Islam? Uh, secondly, uh, was a question of which of the groups, what do I mean by a political Islamist being used to contain, if you like, other threats to the West as they perceived it. Uh, and the, the third one is, do, do Muslims to a, a clash of civilizations? Uh, I think the, the first point, and I mean these are questions because, you know, it's inevitably difficult to, to contract in a, in a short talk a number of points, but uh, what I'm really talking about is also something that is very important. Uh, that just as in Christianity, Islam has always had an experience of tension between literalism uh, and, if you like, an intellectual tradition. Uh, in other words, between transmitted knowledge and intellectual knowledge. Uh, it has old roots, it went back a thousand years. When Islamism, if you like, emerged, it was extremely like in the intellectual and philosophic tradition of Greece and of Plato. And to many people, it seemed to be a little bit removed, if you like, um, from the practice of the early community of Muslims, particularly in the East. So there was an initial reaction of literalism, an attempt to go back and follow the exact meanings of the word, of the Quran, and who have turned to a dogmatic understanding from the outset. These two, if you like, traditions have, have continued. And what I am actually saying in a sense is that also included in the Islamist revolution is a sense that this is a, also a struggle between Islamism, between a literalism, a literalism, a dogmatic, if you like, desire to see the words of the Quran and of course the Sharia to be just what they mean. And of course, the other tradition in Islam, which has been exactly, which has been an extraordinarily powerful one, and equally strong in many ways, has been the one that is Gnostic, which looks through, if you like, the words of the Quran, sees it as symbol and myth, and looks to the, the, the comment in the Quran, the verse which says specifically that there are seven levels of meaning. Of which the seventh is known and well understood to mean by God himself. So there is both, if you like, the tradition of, if you like, a dynamic intellectual knowledge as well as the, the literal. The, the literal. So when I'm talking, if you like, about a, 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 an apolitical Islam, it is the Islam uh, that is apolitical in the Western sense. Apolitical in that they do not take part or indeed are religiously prohibited and in Saudi Arabia politically prohibited from taking part in elections or local or national elections. <coughs> but what it is is an Islam that is hence a literal, if you like, uh, imitation, not intellectual, it seems, but a literal imitation without reasoning, without thinking, if you like, of the precepts, but a literal imitation. Uh, both of the Quran, but also on certainty uh, and the practice of the pious uh, forebear. So this is, if you like, still political because their desire is to get back to a society that is closely resembled uh, uh, that. But I suppose what I'm saying is that if you're a foreign visitor, if you're an American visitor to Saudi Arabia and you've seen Salafism in action where there is no criticism of, of the government and criticism of the king is of course both religiously and criminally uh, prosecuted. Um, where there is no, if you like, where there is a, a tradition of absolute victory, obedience to the king who sees himself as the legitimate inheritor of the authority of the prophet by virtue of being, if you like, from uh, not Quraysh, but of a tribe that is the closest, if you like, to the original Quraysh tribe. That is what I'm meaning by, if you like, a, 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 an, a, an apolitical version. It was, if you like, the Western pursuit of the illusion of trying to find, if you like, an Islamism uh, that was non-threatening, uh, that was apolitical, which was docile. Uh, in other words, it didn't challenge the authority 
way, uh, and, and was one that perhaps could be managed effectively by money and other means. And what I'm saying to you, in a sense, was that this reflected a deep misunderstanding of the roots of, of, of Salafism, uh, which were basically, as I say, uh, uh, after that first period, deeply reinforced by the disaster that overtook the Muslim world uh, with the Mongol invasion and the sense of the need to try, which pushed Islam back into a very conservative and literalist place. And that what happens in, as it surveys the world today, the Salafists, when they look at the world today in many terms, uh, they actually go back and see themselves as fighting the same struggle uh, that they were fighting they, at the time of the sack of uh, Baghdad in the 1300s, late, late uh, 1300s. Um, so uh, that is what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, who are these Muslims? What I'm saying is that um, the idea and the thinking of a particular orientation of Salafism opposed to reasoning and to, if you like, and to any form of intuitive thinking or um, certainly any form of Gnosticism, and therefore see them as direct heresies that must be removed um, from Islam, um, has had enormous impact. Of course, since the 60s, um, with the support of the United States and the West, millions and millions of copies of the works of people like Ibn Tabir have been, uh, who was the direct, uh, if you like, <coughs> model and the authority for Abdul Wahab, um, the founder of Wahhabism. Uh, millions of these copies have been spread. And of course, <coughs> Ibn Tabir about, is, about as, is about as apolitical as Oliver Cromwell. Here was a soldier scholar who fought, of course, the Mongols in the Egyptian Syrian army. Uh, who uh, was opposed to thinking and reason and deeply opposed to any unorthodoxy expressed in his time. Cromwell was a, a dictator of England who had led a rebellion against the king, deposed him, cut his head off, uh, and tried to, again, pursue a literal interpretation uh, of Christianity uh, of England. And having done that, went to, cap to, to Ireland and massacred nearly a fifth of the Catholic population as being heretics. So I think that is about as apolitical as it gets. Now, is it a clash of civilizations? And I regret that I meant to say this in the talk, and I should have said it before. Because I think what is important, and I should have said this and emphasized this, is actually, this is not, these questions about the way we see the world are not unique to Islam at all. If you look at Western philosophy, you will see from Nietzsche and Heidegger and uh, through the Frankfurt School, a strong sense, and Nietzsche was very clear about what would be the consequences, what would be the consequences of this segmented, compartmentalized human life, of treating humans in the world around us as, if you like, specimen objects to be studied and examined, but having no sense of unity, that there wasn't any sense of, of, of unity to the world or um, between the knowing subject who knows and the object that is being known. Um, but what is also, I think, uh, uh, interesting is that all of these trends that you see, if you like, in the secular plane, which are quite present there, which resulted usually in a rather pessimistic conclusion of either that God is dead or a form of nihilism, have been present in Islam, in the intellectual for a thousand years. And it was these ideas that underpinned the Iranian Revolution. Imam Khomeini, particularly, was a student of Mullah Sadra, but also Ibn al-Arabi and others. So these ideas were already present. And if you like, I'm not suggesting that they are the same, but you have, if you like, correspondences going on in the Islamic tradition and in secular and particularly the idea of the human being being more than just, if you like, a, a product of social, historical, other deterministic causes, is now deeply rooted, not so much in Christianism, but in psychology. And you see the same ideas emerging about what happens to human beings that see themselves in this compartmentalized way, in archetypal psychology, in depth psychology, 
uh, and also existential psychology, which are looking, and although these, I'm not suggesting these are you know, withdrawn or there's any, any connection to them, uh, there clearly is um, some, if you like, at least um, resonance in the ideas and thinking, particularly of someone like Martin Heidegger and his whole idea and his rethinking of what is the meaning of being as opposed to uh, aging. But it does have some, if you like, uh, intersection. Because if you go to Tehran, of course, a presidential candidate who is just withdrawn, if you like, Khatani, of course, is first of all known uh, to be uh, an extremely knowledgeable scholar uh, of the whole uh, of a uh, scholar, both of the Frankfurt School of Crafted Critical Thinking, but you also see um, him uh, as being an expert on Hamas. So Western thinking has not been borrowed or taken in, and I'm clearly saying that you know the Iranian Revolution, as often suggested, is not simply a borrowing of Marxist ideas or a borrowing of Western philosophy, but I'm saying that there are some ideas or tracks that are running together. Therefore, I'm saying very clearly, this is not a kind of civilization. These are ideas that are pursuing, if you like, emerging in their separate tracks, in the secular Western track, then in, and have been in Islam, and are being rediscovered in Islam after uh, a number of periods of having fallen, if you like, into a certain mainstream at that time. I'm sorry for a long answer, but they were very important points. Charles Harp from the uh, SBS department, the APP. This one. Um, I can uh, thank you for this uh, interesting talk. Um, I can easily see the relationship between the paradigms that you're proposing and how they are associated with the Iranian Revolution and the availability of those talks within that kind of revolution and the literature emerging from that uh, revolution. But um, I would be interested to see if you can find parallels outside Iran within the Muslim world or within the Arab world. Try to see what's happening. Um, I can think of, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood, who do not have this kind of discursive kind of approach to understanding events. Thank you. Yes. Um, I, I think that what I was trying to describe as a sort of a motor and a change was very much going back the sense of, of moving away from scientism or empiricism, not because there's anything wrong with empiricism, but because mere empiricism, only empiricism, was the problem when it, if you like, cut out or, or, or removed intuitive and other ways of thinking. But where I think you see political transformations clearly taking place, as you say, and you see it particularly in, in, in movements like Hezbollah, where myth and image and models Icons uh, as people, icons of early narrative that have some resonance that go back, if you like, uh, as an explanation of moral principles are, are very important to how they feel. Where has this taken place is that I think much of this imagery, some of this imagery, not all of it, has, of course, not directly, but has effect, what I call political theism, has had its impact. Uh, on Sunni movements too. You would like to give you just one example. Um, during this war in Gaza that, that took place uh, just recently, uh, I spoke to some very secular West Bank Palestinians during it. And all of them said, look, you know, what is so interesting is that every night everyone, of course, listens to Hassan Nasrallah. And of course, this fell during the backdrop of Ashura. And of course, not because he was proselytizing, but he was, of course, the speeches were against the backdrop of Ashura. And they said, listening to Hassan Nasrallah every night is Islamicizing the political discourse in the West Bank. We are talking about, if you like, the same language, about martyrdom, about sacrifice, about heroic stance. We are seeing it in this way. In other words, to a certain extent, what happened in Gaza was becoming, if you like, the Kerbal of the Sunni, a heroic Muslim stand against overwhelming odds in the name of justice. 
So I think that there are, you know, even unconscious transmissions of certain really basic um, uh, images. And this is what I mean by going back to archetypal images of narratives and stories that imply uh, justice. And I think that one of the things that we have seen is the way in which if you want to change a, 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 a people's thinking, clearly many people will not go back to the intellectual tradition of Islam. It may not be acceptable to them. They may not be able to. But through ideas and thinking uh, of this sort that touches deeply these emotional stories, of finding new models that displace, if you like, Western models, of finding new language uh, that, if you like, gives life to something instead of being inert and dead <coughs> and uh, that actually gives action, if you like, to the model instead of inaction. And then I think you see these conditions also displayed, not necessarily to the same extent in all, if you like, non shi um, uh, 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 Islamist movements, but you see some characteristics of them taking place. I quite agree also, uh, you didn't actually make the point, but you also see in some of the movements the counter currents of literalism creeping into the same movements. So some movements are the same. And in fact, one of the things I think we could almost talk of is, you know, the, the Iranian revolution as such was, was in a sense, I mean, Ali Shariati wrote a book uh, called uh, religion versus religion. I mean, it wasn't religion versus secularism. It wasn't religion versus the West. And what he was really talking about was the struggle, if you like, within the Iranian revolution against its own literalism. And one of the aspects that Imam Khomeini suffered enormously was from that sense of clerical passivity. And he was, uh, even when he went to Qom, uh, Qom and, uh, uh, to lecture uh, afterwards, uh, uh, many of the clerics there, the literalist clerics, used to purify the glass out of which his 11-year-old son drank because he thought Afan, or uh, that type of philosophy, in <coughs> Qom. So I think it is also, you see both within movements, both of these currents within movements as well. Any other comments? Any other comments, questions? Go ahead. to raise or I'd like you to comment on them. First about uh, the institutionalization of some Islamic structures within the state. I mean like to have a certain structure controlled by the state, just like having, bringing secularism from the West and trying to install it here and when they maybe discover that sometimes it's inseparable between you know religion and the, and the state, then some concept went on as, okay, let's have, let's control religion by the state, but you cannot, you know, separate religion from the state. And it happened in some countries, mainly in Turkey. And some institutions have the budget of these institutions bigger than the budgets for many ministries. So I would like to have your point on this, and to what extent it contributed to the revolution tendency, and maybe to the dichotomy between the state and the politicized, maybe masses, Islam, maybe political Islam in this sense. My second point is about maybe the difference between a revolution versus evolution. Because sometimes when we see a revolution, we see people, you know, replacing people from top to bottom, but not necessarily making a serious system change. Sometimes it's just a regime change. To what extent do you think we need sometimes evolution rather than revolution? And my last point is about the market nowadays, about the financial crisis nowadays. To what extent do you think Islamic perspective can contribute maybe to keep or, I don't know, to help getting out of this crisis? Thank you. crisis that fell on Islamism in that hundred years of nation, Western nation statehood um, until the 1920s, but beyond that, that huge 
crisis, which resulted in massacres and ethnic cleansing and transfers of population done in the interest of building a modern state, left many Muslims and many Islamists with the sense of the overwhelming power of the centralized, if you like it, top-down, uh, unitary nation state. Not so much in the sense of being a, a beneficial thing, but they saw very clearly its power and its destructive ability. So that it did have very clearly a strong reaction in terms of many movements believed that the only way to deal with this sort of power uh, was actually to have a, a state that could confront and, and contest it. I think that uh, that has been a phase which is still there that is in a sense giving rise to new thinking about what is the need of a nation state uh, in, in, uh, in a different era. I think uh, clearly what happened um, uh, also in cases like Iran was of course that the whole construct and the constitution became overtaken by the necessities and needs of an immediate war. And wars, as you know, tend to produce very hierarchical and structured uh, uh, forms. So I think that um, uh, the, there is a great deal of thinking going on about what is the future of the nation state if it is not going to end up by producing some of the problems that the Western state has produced for, 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 for its own citizens and perhaps looking to perhaps a, a flatter, more networked, looser system of, of nation state and go back to some traditional models of, if you like, political structure and authority that have existed in this region before the Western uh, in intervention. Um, but I think what you say is that uh, uh, is quite true. You certainly, that if you meet people who took part in the revolution in Iran, uh, all of them would say now that you know, this was not what they intended, and this is not what they wanted, and this is not con consistent uh, with the ideals of the revolution, and would like to see something very different. And part of the problem is how to change the nation state uh, in, in a way, but at the same time have to deal with the practical thing of being able to be strong enough to withstand the pressures of, although a weakened, but still very strong West, and an international order which is used, if you like, particularly to put leverage on nation states to do the will of um, the so-called international community. So how to deal with those issues, I think, is something. And as I say, I mean, we've only started this process. Islam and the process of trying to rediscover itself. I don't think we've got anyone has the, the final answer or the model. Or, and, and the way in which it would go will depend, I'm sure, a great deal upon events. Revolution versus evolution. Well, I think everyone is, is very clear about the dangers of revolution. Revolution can end up by consuming itself. We saw that in France, uh, and what happened that it ended up by consuming its own forces. Uh, but I do think that most of those that are part of the revolution, whether this will be sufficient is a different issue, but are very much aware of the need that revolutions cannot outreach themselves, cannot ex exceed their boundaries of possibility and capability because otherwise it risks unleashing emotions and dynamic, and dynamic that may be uncontrollable for everyone. But at the same time, it has become quite difficult to evolve uh, in, if you like, a, a mindset and dealing with a mindset which, if you like, has had such a grip uh, as it seems for, for many Islamists for the last two to three hundred years. How do, you, how do you transform people who have become so used and so been part of their life to thinking in an instrumental, empirical fashion uh, of um, the opposite, if you like, of the sense of tawhid and looking at the world in terms of multiplicity and looking at terms of the human being in this way? It does require a form of revolution if one is going to transform people from this understanding of the world to a different understanding. I, I, when I use the word revolution, it doesn't all mean violence, I, I, uh, but it means a, a, a disconnect continuity from past habits and practices. Uh, and the last thing is, does Islamism have anything to offer in terms of economics? 
Well, I hope from what I earlier said, I think it certainly does. Uh, because what it's trying to do, and what I think we see, is I'm speaking as, as, as a former economist, uh, but what we see in terms of the Islamic view about what has happened in the West was very, very clearly predicted. The, the sense uh, Islamist economics from the beginning was pointed out uh, that what would happen uh, when the West moved away to fractional banking systems, the creation of money within the commercial and even the non-commercial banking system, this huge unleashing of credit and the ability to create credit within it. Uh, Islamist economics from the beginning uh, argued that this would lead to great concentration of wealth. Uh, it would lead to disparities of income between sectors of the population uh, and to a lack of justice and principle. What I think at the moment is that in the present economic crisis, we don't see the West really doing more than trying to get back to the status quo ante. No one's saying, well, why is it gone wrong quite in that particular way? And I do think that uh, there are many insights in Islamist economics which are, are, are very important. I mean, those are the ones, that, I mean, just a few of the ones that, uh, that, uh, that I've dealt with, uh, tried to deal with in the book. In the back. Mr. Krupp, my name is Gary Collins, I'm a lawyer. I'd like to focus your attention on the Palestinian political situation. To what extent is the support for Hamas uh, really a rejection of Fatah? Uh, Fatah has a reputation for being corrupt, Secondly, with regard to the Christian Palestinian population, where do they fit? There's certainly a sense of, of anxiety amongst a lot of Christian Palestinians about the rise of Hamas. Hamas has been asked the question whether their objective is to impose Sharia and to have an Islamic state. The standard response is first things first. First the occupation, then we deal with Palestinian society. So as a Christian Palestinian, seems that, aside from the PFLP, which is outside the mainstream, uh, started by a Christian, you have Hanan Ashrawi, who is certainly uh, a brilliant woman, a strong political leader, but she's been, uh, she's also outside the, the old boy network, and her work has been uh, largely bypassed. Uh, not only 
in those courses, but there was a more direct one. And that is, from the outset, I mean, uh, Hamas offered a fundamentally different view of the vision of the future to Fatah. Fatah has always, at least certainly from 93, uh, taken the view that if you address the asymmetry of power between the Palestinians and Israelis, there was only one way to deal with that, and that was to try and persuade and co-opt the Europeans and the Americans to sort of weigh in on the balance of the scales on your side. Uh, and that this was how it had to be. And if we had to try, they had to try and co-opt and uh, cajole Europeans and Americans into doing the right thing uh, by the Palestinians. I think what Hamas has said from the outset has been, there's no question uh, of relying on either America or the Europeans to do the right thing by us. It's not gonna happen. We have to stand on our own feet. And if we, that means, that if we're going to negotiate with Israel, that ultimately it's not going to be from saying, oh, please help us to help you, and we need to do this. And we're going to negotiate with Israel, they have to be out of a position of respect. There cannot be equality in military power, that's clear. There cannot be an absolute balance. But between separate compartments, you can have a degree of respect. And they believe very clearly that, in contrast to Fatah, they do not believe that Israel will come to a settlement or a solution with the Palestinians that they regard uh, with uh, yellow, uh, with disdain, or, or a sense of contempt. That it's only when they treat people with seriousness, however grudging, however much it's under their YouTube like. So I think that um, uh, the model has been, in a sense, that uh, the idea that when you sit down, when they sit down with us, as one day they surely will, and negotiate, both sides of the table have to understand if one or other leaves the table prematurely, the other side will experience pain. It will not just be simply a painless exercise in leaving the table and, and go. Because without that, there will never be uh, a just solution. So I'm really saying to you is that there is a I mean, a fundamental, uh, philosophical, practical position difference between how the two sides perceive the approach uh, to attaining a peaceful state. And I don't think that's often seen quite apart from the other aspects of uh, how they, you know, administration and corruption and other things. Fundamental political divide. I just quickly say, uh, in terms of the Christian population, of course, in, in, in many areas, particularly in Bethlehem, uh, the Christian population voted for Hamas and then went into a power sharing agreement in the municipality in, in Bethlehem. And overall, in the 2006 election, the vast majority of Christians actually um, uh, voted with uh, Hamas uh, uh, rather than Fatah. Uh, the, there is, of course, still fear that it exists. But many, I mean, there are a number of incidents that are, are attributed to Hamas, and the evidence clearly shows, and I can't say all of them, but in certainly some of them, uh, that these, some of these actions were done deliberately to discredit Hamas and to raise uh, particular fears. On Sharia, on Sharia, uh, I remember once, uh, some time ago, I wrote a paper, and I asked the political committee of Hamas to, to read it to see if they believed it was accurate reflecting their position. And they came back to me, and one of them said, well, you know, it's all right, but we're really upset about one thing. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, why did you put this here? And I said, well, why? You put, we are going to enforce Sharia law. And why did you put that? And I said, well, because I thought you would. And they said, well, you've got absolutely no basis for thinking that. I can't say to you, he said, <laughs> we definitely will not do it because there's no decision being made. But listen to me. My children go to school, boys and girls together. I dress in a Western way. We live in a different modern society when we are here. So you've no reason to think that we do this. We believe that we children, boys and girls, should be educated together because it's in their interest, interest of my children. So that I believe <coughs> that we will try and find a more pluralistic way. But you have no reason to assume 
that there was a decision taken or that it's absolute necessity, that it will be imposed. Uh, yes, uh, this is Yvonne Fidelio. Uh, I am from the PSPA department here at AED. Um, I have both a quick, very quick comment and uh, question. Uh, I'm, I'm very fascinated with um, uh, the ism phenomena, I call it. You know, how we associate uh, these deep letters at the end of each word uh, to make it more legitimate for us sometimes to study a certain phenomena or to call it a movement or so forth. Um, it seems to me that we went, uh, I, you know, you might agree with me or disagree with me, uh, that we went through different uh, movements um, in the Islamic world, starting with what I would call I would call probably uh, revivalism of Islam and the Islamic world. And then we moved from uh, the revival uh, to uh, maybe uh, fundamentalism and then to extremism, and then maybe later to Islamism, and later on after September 11, something like terrorism. <coughs> and recently I've read a lot about uh, Islamic militants, so it's military Islam or you know, so forth. Uh, do you do you think um, that uh, fundamentalism, extremism, are part of Islamism, or are these stages that actually preceded uh, Islamism in the Islamic world? Well, I think you make a, a very good point about you know writing anything about Islam is a sort of become a minefield because you know as soon as you have one word to describe something, people have, it starts attracting baggage. other forms and extremism and other words are used not to for purposes of communicating they're used to undermine and demonize uh, people um, so uh, of course it's difficult to, to try and uh, explain uh, all of these things but what I was really in a sense saying that the, the migration of some movements towards a, a literalism that turns into a, a narrow hatred for other Muslims, for Shiism and for Sufism and for all of those, is a form of a, a extremism that, that uh, can happen as a process of fragmentation. So I'm of course saying that these things are happening within, if you like, uh, the Islamic sphere, um, to borrow a word from it and say. Um, uh, I don't have any sort of uh, simple answers except that I think one should discard much of this language because, I mean, it's so much this process of what I call multiplicity, of sort of Western dividing things down into these different groups and saying, oh, you know, and you have this discussion and it becomes obvious, you know, in not so long ago I had a discussion and I mentioned Sharia and someone got up and said, oh, you can't talk about Sharia because you're for Sharia, in fact, there are more than four Sharias as North African versions of the main four law schools and we have to, and you say, you know, well, you can't have a discussion if you go on to this sort of multiplicity. And the aim of the book, and the title of the book, was trying to find the essence of the Islam. In other words, it was trying to do the opposite. It was to try and get back at, and draw out what is the common thread, what are the key things, particularly in my context, of what is and what constitutes this huge transformative change that is so exciting energizing millions of people and building Iran. Um, and I think uh, I said to you also that of course not only in the isms, but I, what I found so difficult was when you were looking at the Islamic intellectual tradition, you know, we have been for 200 years in a world that's hostile to any form of metaphysics. Even though the empirical scientific <laughs> worldview of the West is itself a metaphysical tradition and depends on metaphysical foundation. But nonetheless, you know, anything that one says that is about the type of use of uh, the imaginal world of myth or narrative as a tool for political transformation.